start having incontinence issue. So um, I got treated and I started taking courses to help myself and I was cured. So I was sold on pelvic health. So today um, I wanna talk to you about what you can do to prepare your pelvic floor for labor. And you know, I'm sure most of you, I'm guessing that most of you are first time moms. And with that, you're probably feeling a little bit anxious and fearful about giving birth because of the unknowns of labor and birth, and also because there's a pandemic going on. So that doesn't help the situation either. But I believe that if you know uh, how your body works during labor and birthing and what you can do to prepare, then you go into labor with much more confidence about the whole process. So I'm going to switch over to my um, presentation um, because if I don't, I'll forget what I'm supposed to say. So one second here. Okay. So I just want to go into slideshow. Okay. Other than being a pelvic health physiotherapist, I'm also a mother of two girls. They are seven and 10 now, but this is what they look like when they were kids. And uh, I don't know if you can see the similarity between my kids and tools, but um, yeah, apparently they inherited my good genes for having their hair sticking up. Anyway, so in this presentation, we're going to talk about pelvic biomechanics for labor and birth. We're going to, I'm going to go through prenatal exercises, and this includes, you know, the perineal stretching, as well as the role of Kegels in birthing um, preparation. And then we'll look at birthing positions and pushing practices for labor. All right, so first, pelvic biomechanics for labor and birth. So I just wanted to go through a quick anatomy lesson about the pelvis and pelvic floor muscles. And I hope you can see this well, because my lighting is not the greatest at this point. Okay, so here we go. We have a pelvis, and this is the front of the pelvis. Yeah. Now, if you put your hands on your hips, this is what you would feel. This is what we call the wings of the pelvis. This is the pubic bone, which is about two and a half, three inches below your belly button. And when you're close to your due date, it can feel a little bit tender in this area. This is the back of the pelvis. This is the spine. And here's the sacrum. And here's the tailbone right here. Okay. So the tailbone is super important in birthing. I'm going to, to go um, into that a little in a little bit. But if you look at the bottom, of the pelvis, we've got the red part is uh, the pelvic floor muscles, which line the bottom of the pelvis. Now what they do um, is of course they hold up the organs from falling down. Uh, that's important. And as Kristen mentioned, they've got a urinary, bowel, and gas control function. And they also have a sexual and reproductive function. Okay. So Having said that, okay, we're going to look at how birthing works from a, from, a, uh, from a biomechanics perspective. So I'm going to show you another pelvis. This is my other one that stretches a bit because the other one doesn't stretch, it just has the muscles. So if you look at this pelvis right here, what happens when you go into labor, it's hopefully at that point, your baby is going to be upside down like this right and on the day that you go into the that you go into labor your uterus starts contracting so what happened is the baby starts to go down the pelvis and as the baby goes down the baby spins a little bit so that the baby's face faces the back and it's kind of hard to see at this point, but maybe you can see it here. So the baby's face is supposed to face the back, and then the baby comes out of the pelvis like this, okay? And I'll show you the front too. It comes out of the pelvis with the face facing the back and the back of the head facing the front. All right. And a couple of things also happen to the pelvis while that's happening. So as the, the baby goes through the first part of the pelvis, called the pelvic inlet, 
the pelvis opens up a little bit like this. It stretches slightly this way to allow the baby to come through. Then the baby descends down the pelvis. And as the baby comes out of the pelvis, the sits bone, these two things, splay out a little bit. And the tailbone, which is this part, shifts back a little bit to let the baby come out. All right. Now this position with the baby's head or with the baby's face facing the back, that's called the fancy term for it. It's called occiput anterior um, position. If the baby doesn't face the back, if the baby's head faces the back instead, meaning the head pushes on the spine, I don't know if you can see it, that's called a sunny side up baby or back labor or occiput posterior baby. I might not have time to go through it at this presentation, uh, during this presentation, but if anybody is interested at the end, please feel free to ask me about back labor and what you can do to reduce the risk of back labor. Okay, so moving on. Uh, I have my cheat sheets here. We're going to talk about prenatal exercises. Okay. Ashley, before we do that, does anybody have any questions that you want to ask right now? So I'm just going to check the chat screen to see whether there's any questions. Okay, no questions. All right. So the first exercise that I'm going to show you um, is called a flower bloom breath. Okay. Now the flower bloom breath is a breath that I've been sharing with um, pregnant mamas as they get ready for labor. And it's a breathing uh, dash visualization technique and it helps to relax the pelvic floor and opens the body for birthing. It also soothes the nervous system, which ultimately helps with the intensity of the contraction. So I would invite you to try this out with me while I go through the cues. So first, you take a few deep breaths in through the nose and out through the mouth. And as you inhale, imagine your rib cage expanding like a balloon. So you want to focus your inhalation going into the rib cage. So imagine the rib cage expanding like a balloon. Just feel it expanding from side to side, from front to back and from top to bottom. If you've taken yoga, you've probably been told to breathe into the belly. So there's a reason why we don't do that. Um, and I can go into that later, but for now, just focus on the rib cage. Your belly might expand a little bit too, but focus your attention on the rib cage for now. So after you breathe in and out a few times, imagine your perineum which is the area between your vaginal opening and your anus, blooming and fluffing out like a flower. So imagine your perineum, perineum softening and blooming as you breathe in and out. So that's sort of the basics of the flower bloom breath. And you can, you can start practicing the flower bloom breath uh, around week 34 or 35 for about two or three minutes a day, every day. Uh, and you might want to incorporate this breath while you're practicing your perineal massage, um, your breathing positions, and your pushing. So next I'm going to talk about perineal massage. So ultimately perineal massage helps to prepare the vaginal opening for labor and it can potentially reduce the risk of tearing. And this is what most moms want to know when they come for their prenatal appointment. So there's strong evidence to support um, perineal massage for third and fourth degree tear, which is a tear that goes uh, all the way to your anus. However, there's conflicting evidence for the minor tears like the first and the second degree tear. The evidence is not so strong. But I would say the most important um, aspect of the perineal massage is to, help, uh, is to help get your body and mind used to the sensation of having the vaginal opening stretch during labor so that you can sort of uh, get yourself psychologi psychologically prepared for what's to come. 
However, um, perineal massage for not, it's not for everyone. So you wanna check with your doctor and midwife to make sure that it's okay for you. So if you have the following con conditions, you probably don't wanna do this. So the contraindications are bacterial infection, risk of premature labor, unexplained bleeding, yeast infection, vaginal herpes, or premature rupture of membrane. All right, so to do perineal massage, I'm going to switch back to the other screen. Okay, all right. So here is the pelvic floor. Okay, so I have this upside down. Here's the vaginal opening right here. Yeah. So imagine the vaginal opening like a clock. Okay. So the top would be 12 o'clock and the bottom would be six o'clock. Now for most moms, especially in the later stages of labor, this area right here, your perineum can be kind of tight because it has to hold up all of this weight from above. So before you do the stretching, what you want to do is just gently release the tension from this area. So you can do that by just gently pushing into it, okay? And wait until you feel the tension melting from the perineum. And I just want to back up a little bit by saying that you can do this yourself or you can get somebody to help you do it. Do it. But I have to say that doing it yourself is a little bit challenging, especially you know, when you're 34, 35 weeks, when your belly is, is, is bigger. So having said that, um, it's possible, um, but a little bit uncomfortable. Okay, so it's better if somebody um, can do it for you. Another thing is when you do the perineum stretching, you might need a little bit of lubricant, uh, preferably a water-based lubricant. And I recommend something like Good Clean Love Naked, that's a brand that you can buy at Shoppers Drug Mart or uh, Sliquid, S-L-I-Q-U-I-D. Those two are good lubricants because they don't have anything funky in them. Any kind of ingredient that can mess up your hormones or your, um, the flora of your vagina or um, the pH level, the acidity of your, of your vagina because disruption to those things can actually um, increase the risk of you getting vaginal infections. So that's, that's not fun. So having a good lubricant is important. Okay, so after you release the perineum by pushing into it gently, this may take 30 seconds to a minute for it to release, then you can start stretching it out. So starting at six o'clock, you would insert your finger about one knuckle or one and a half knuckle into the vagina and you just gently pull it down, yeah? And then after you do the six o'clock, then you go towards the five o'clock, you pull it and hold again for about five to 10 seconds. Then you move on to four o'clock, to three o'clock, and then to two o'clock. I don't recommend going from 11 to 12 to one because this area is very sensitive, especially later on um, in the pregnancy. 12 o'clock is where your urethra is, so you definitely don't want to stretch it. 11 o'clock and one o'clock are really close to it, so it can be very tender, okay? So the person stretching you might get a little kick if they stretch you too close to 12 o'clock, okay? Now, once you get to two o'clock, you can go backward and go back to three, four, five, six, and then you can start going to seven, eight, nine, ten. So in each position, you would pull and wait. And then you go to the next one, pull and weigh. So the intensity of this, you should feel a little bit burning, tingling sensation, but it should be tolerable. It shouldn't be so painful that you have to brace yourself or uh, cry or scream, okay? So on a scale of zero to 10, the uh, pain intensity should not be more than three out of 10. All right. Next thing is, uh, we're going to talk about some exercises that you can do to stretch out the, the pelvic floor. So I'm going to switch back to the presentation. Okay. All right, so the first exercise that you can try out is a deep squat. Um, now, you can also do this without the block. Uh, either way, it's equally effective. Um, 
And, you know, doing this will help to stretch out the pelvic floor and you can practice the uh, flower blooming breath while you're doing the deep squat. The next exercise is the butterfly where you stretch out your inner thighs as well as your pelvic floor. Um, you can also do, th do, do this uh, lying on your back with your legs laid out to the side. And if the stretch is too much for your inner thighs, you can also put some pillows or blocks under your thighs to ease off some of the tension. And this one is also really good if you have pain in your pubic bone. Um, yeah, it might also help with that. And I suggest doing the deep squat and the butterfly every two to three days for about two to three minutes. All right, Kegels and pelvic floor contractions. So a lot of people think that they should do a million Kegels before they go into labor. Um, we don't suggest that because first of all, for some women doing Kegels can be harmful if their pelvic floor is already hypertonic. And you know, one of the indicators that their pelvic floor is hypertonic is if they have pain with intercourse, especially with initial penetration. However, if you want to be sure, come in and see one of us uh, and we can let you know for sure whether there's an issue with the tone of your pelvic floor. Mia, yeah. so, it, it's yeah. I'm sorry, we just aren't seeing the slides right now yet. Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't know that I didn't share back. No problem at all. Thanks so much. Yeah, no problem. Oh, here it is. Kegels and pelvic floor contraction. Okay, I need to go backward a little bit. I'm sorry. This is a deep squat slide that I was talking about. Okay, so in the deep squat, you can do it without the um, block or with the block. It's up to you. They're equally effective. And here is the one for the butterfly where you sit with your legs lay out and you can also sit on a block if um if you're not flexible enough i'm hyper flexible actually <laughs> which is actually not a great thing either okay so kegels and pelvic floor contraction as i said before for some women doing kegels during pregnancy can be harmful if their pelvic floor is already hypertonic so to make sure um that they know whether it's it's tight or not please come in and see one of us so we can tell you whether you should do kegels or not but most importantly, um, you know, in the last four or five weeks of pregnancy, the goal of Kegels is to increase blood circulation to the tissue to keep it healthy, not to strengthen the muscles. Um, so I would suggest not doing more than 10 to 20 Kegels a day for that purpose. And I want to show you something. So if you look at the pelvic floor here at the bottom, if you do too many Kegels in the last four or five weeks, it can actually close down or like make the space smaller because as the muscles get stronger they get shorter right so at that point it's not a good idea because you know when you close your due date you want the pelvic outlet to be as big as possible you want to maximize that so doing the flower bloom breath doing um, the deep squat and the pelvic uh, and the butterfly um, to release and to open the pal to stretch out the pelvic floor that's something that we would recommend in the first, in the last four or five weeks. All right. Any questions or comments? Okay. Mia, yeah, it's Kristen. There were some good ones about yeah. uh, perineal yeah. massage and how often you recommend to do it yeah. as, as well as, um, so I actually, did you want to answer that one? I answered what I typically say, but we all practice a slightly bit different. Yeah. Does, so the first one I'm seeing is, does the bloom happen on the exhale? Yeah. So for labor preparation, it does happen on the exhale, especially like during the last four or five weeks, you also want the bloom to happen in the exhale. I know that some people practice this, uh, as part of their core breath. If you read the book by, um, What's that lady's name? Prepare to push. Um, do you know her name, Kristen? I can't remember now. I should, uh, yeah. but I can <laughs> also find it. Yeah. Yeah. So in that core breath, you don't do the bloom on the exhale. You do a little bit of contraction on the exhale, but for labor preparation, starting week 34 and 35, you want the bloom to happen both with the inhale and exhale. Yeah. Thanks for that question. That's really good. And sorry about the slides again. Hopefully it's, it's resolved now. All right. 
So I'm going to go back to the slides again and talk about birthing positions. Okay. It's Kim Volpini who does the proposal. Yeah. yeah. Kim 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 Volpini, Kim Volpini. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So All right. All right. So research shows that walking and being in upright positions in the first stage of labor. So this is when you're having close uh, and frequent contractions, close, frequent, and strong contractions, reduces the duration of labor, the chance of cesarean birth, and the need for epidural. And it does not have any negative effects on mom and baby's well-being. But having said that, there is no position, there's no one position that is best for every woman or every baby. Each position has its pros and cons. So uh, it's really helpful that you listen to your body and um, you know try to see what your body needs. And now this may sound kind of vague because let's say you've never been in labor before. So you're probably thinking like, how would I know what I'm supposed to do or you know, how I'm supposed to feel. Well, it's sort of like sitting on a couch. Sometimes you need to twist and shift a little bit to feel comfortable. And that's what you feel in labor. You know, you notice, that, okay, if I shift a little bit, if I sit down, if I stand up, if I lunch, you know, that might feel better. So that's, that's what you're looking for. All right. So having, so right here, I'm showing you some positions that you can do in stage one of labor, where you get active, frequent, and strong contractions. Having said that, there's another stage before stage one. It's sort of stage 1A, and this is sort of stage 1B. So in stage 1A, which is, you know, in the early labor part where you're having infrequent contraction, not so regular, that's when you should try to conserve your energy as much as possible. You know, you might feel excited that labor is starting. You might feel a little bit anxious and a little bit worried. So in stage 1A, what you want to do is to try to relax or distract yourself by doing crafts or watching a movie. Um, yeah, something to take your mind off. Um, and try not to go too crazy. Try to conserve your energy because labor is a marathon. It's going to take a lot out of you. So just take it easy. Now, even stage one, when you have active, frequent, and strong contractions, even though it's recommended that you do you know, you use positions that um, have gravity and movement to help the baby rotate down the pelvis. Um, again, I don't suggest walking for 10 kilometers or climbing, you know, 20 flights of stairs, but just doing things slowly and kind of mindfully um, so that you can conserve your energy as well. Um, I also recommend that you maximize and use the rest period between each contractions because it's just as important as your contraction. So during the rest, you know, practice relaxation, practice your deep breathing to, to sort of enable your nervous system to calm down. Because another thing is that if your nervous system starts to uh, get uh, kind of upregulated, what we mean is, you know, when it's uh, really tense and, uh, there's a lot going on, it started getting stressed, that can release a lot of stress hormones in your body, which can stall labor. So relaxation, deep breathing are really good things for labor. Okay. All right. Another thing that I want to mention is that earlier, uh, we were talking about how the pelvis opens for labor. So I was talking about how the pelvis opens like this at the beginning. Then as the baby goes down the birth canal, the pelvis sort of goes like this. Okay, so there's no correlation between your contractions, how dilated your cervix is, and how far down your baby descends down the pelvis. Um, but one of the things your provider, your care provider can tell you is where the baby is in your pelvis. It's called a baby station. So if your baby is right here, what you can do to open your pelvis is you can go in positions where your knees are apart, your feet together, okay? That allows your pelvis to um, open at the top, all right? And then once your baby starts going down the birth canal past the pelvic 
inlet, you can start doing this type of this, uh, position, like walking, climbing, you know, climbing stairs, lunging on a chair to help the baby rotate and move down with gravity and movement. Okay, so I hope that's clear. Okay, so in stage two, once you start pushing and birthing, um, study says that um, the studies say that using a variety of positions during the second stage um, helps you work with your baby as he or she turns and comes comes down through your pelvis. And the positions that you choose will increase your comfort and help the baby's progress. However, I'd say pushing is one thing, but when it comes to birthing, your, your birthing position might be dependent on what your care provider is comfortable with. And some care providers is only comfortable um, delivering your baby when you birth on your back or when you birth on your back with your um, feet up and stir up. So, you know, that might be something that you want to go through with them uh, beforehand, just so that you guys are on the same page. All right. So there are two types of pushing practices. One is called spontaneous pushing, which is pushing when you have the urge to push. So what happens is when the baby descends down, uh, to a certain point in your pelvis, okay, the pressure from the baby's head is going to trigger a reflex, almost like your bowel movement reflex, like when you need to poo, you need to poo, right? It's sort of the same thing. Um, so this triggers the body to have strong involuntary urges to push. And um, yeah, and your care provider will ask you whether you feel like you, you need to have a bowel movement or you have pressure in your pubic bone. The second type of pushing is called directed or coach pushing. And usually it's when the staff or care provider to hold your, to hold your breath while you bear down and push. Now, why should we move away from directed or coach pushing? It's because when you do directed pushing, especially for a long period of time, and I've heard of women who push for, you know, two hours, three hours. It's not ideal because when you hold your breath, you're decreasing oxygen to your lungs. So over two or three hours, the oxygen level in moms as well as baby's um, body will go down. And that's when baby's heart rate starts to drop. And that's when emergency intervention can sometimes take place. So it's not ideal. Um, also, it's, um, you know, that, um, that breath holding, bearing down type of um, pushing, it can increase your risk, your risk of getting pelvic organ prolapse, which means that your organs start to sag down more, which is not great, okay? So a few directed coach pushing is okay. And sometimes your care provider might ask you to do that at the end to get the baby out. Um, but for a long period is not ideal. So if you had to push, I suggest for a long period, I suggest that you open your jaw, separate the top and bottom row of your teeth and make low growling sound. I know that sounds kind of weird, but those things help to actually uh, relax your pelvic floor so that your pelvic floor can open. Whereas when you close your throat, that actually closes the pelvic floor. So it doesn't make sense to push the baby down while closing the pelvic floor, right? All right. So in terms of timing of pushing, um, you can have delay pushing or intermediate or immediate pushing. So delay is when you wait for the urge to push to happen. So sometimes even though the cervix is 10 centimeter dilated, mom doesn't have the urge to push because the baby has not descended down enough to trigger that push reflex. So what, that's what laboring down is. It's waiting for one to two hours for the spontaneous urge to push to kick in, even though the cervix is 10 centimeter dilated. Immediate pushing is you start to push as soon as you are 10 centimeter, regardless of whether you have the urge to push or not. Okay. So, um, 
Now, I just want to show you something. So according to the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists Canada, and this is the top of the top in terms of birthing professionals, um, they've come up with these guidelines based on evidence-based uh, research. So they're saying that pushing can begin when the cervix is fully dilated, the baby is engaged, meaning the baby has descended far enough, and mom feels an urge to push. And delayed pushing is preferred, so you, know, you shouldn't push. When mom has no urge to push, baby is above station plus two. So station means how far down the baby is. So above station place, to means baby hasn't descended down far enough to trigger this push reflex and in a non-occiput anterior position. So this is what I was talking about. Normally, um, preferably, I mean ideally, the baby's head should turn in a way that allows the baby to come out of the pelvis most easily. However, if the baby is not in that position, which is what they mean by non-occiput anterior position, um, you know, assuming that the fetus does not have any kind of abnormal uh, heart rate, um, and let's say that mom is okay, then we should wait for this urge to push uh, to happen. So the method of pushing spontaneous or directed uh, with the salva maneuver, directed usually involves the salva when you hold your breath and bear down. It should be chosen using the woman's own preference and Directed pushing may assist with the final expulsion of the head. Yeah, so sometimes directed pushing is necessary to get the baby out, but definitely not like for over hours of pushing. And again, this is something that you may want to talk to your care provider before, um, you know, before labor, and just to sort out what their what their standards are in terms of you know when you should push, uh, whether they. Um, advocate direct pushing um, or um, spontaneous pushing, whether they believe in delay pushing, um, et cetera. Because I have to say that care providers all operate differently. They don't operate the same way. And some may be slow to the changes that have taken place in terms of guidelines. So it's not fair that you have to advocate to yourself in some ways, but I feel like the more, uh, you know, people talk to their care provider about what they know and, and, and uh, what they think is good for their body and their baby, then things will start to change. All right, so how do we support the pelvic floor while pushing? Well, let's say if you are on your back, um, semi-sitting or recline, the issue with that is that as I said before, as the baby comes down, the sacrum or the, sorry, the coccyx or the tailbone has to shift back a little bit for the baby to come, to come out. However, if you're lying on your sacrum and the coccyx, it has nowhere to go, right? It can't go back. So it's helpful to have a couple of hand towels in that case and roll them up. And then you can sort of place them on the two sides. You can place them on the two sides of your sacrum like this, one roll here and one roll here, so that as the baby comes out, I'm so sorry, I'm so disoriented with the screen. So as the baby comes out, the tailbone has a little bit of room to shift back if you put some kind of spacing between the sacrum and the bed, okay? All right, now, if you are on your side birthing, it's a good idea to have your birth supporting person, your support person, whoever that is, to hold your leg up with the knee turned in, okay? And what I mean by that is this, I'm going to back, go back to this slide. See the side lying slide where the knees turn in and the, the foot is sort of turned up to the ceiling? That position helps to open up the pelvic outlet, right? As we talked about before, when you're pushing, the baby's right here. So by opening the pelvic outlet, that helps the baby to come out more easily. Uh, so going back to this, all right. So however though, chances are you're not going to have a peanut ball holding your leg up like that. Usually it's somebody holding your leg up because your care provider will wanna see what's going on in your, um, in your vaginal opening. So anyway, 
right? If you're on all four, um, you might want to have your knees turn in again. That helps the pelvic outlet to open. And I'll show you that again. So if you look at that picture on hands and knees, I did it with my knees turn in and my feet turn out. Yeah. So when the baby is basically at the bottom of the pelvis ready to come out, that position helps to keep the pelvic outlet open. Okay. All right. So studies have shown that using warm compress to support the perineum and perineal massage while the baby is crowning help to reduce tearing. And most of the um, care providers will support your perineum. However, in terms of using a warm compress, and I mean, you know, this is like a towel that you dip in warm water to help warm up the tissue, the hospital or birthing center might not provide that. So that might be something that you want to bring in, like you might want to bring, bring in a little crock pot to warm the water and to keep a warm compress with you. Um, and again, maybe something that you want to talk to your care provider beforehand to see that it's okay to do that because they have, they all have different rules and different ways of doing things. So it's good to check in with them. However, the evidence is really, really good in terms of supporting the warm compress to support the perineum. Okay. All right. So I think I've thrown a lot of information at you today. But the main takeaways is that if you can remember to do your flower blooming breath, um, and I forgot to add here, your perineal massage, um, ask for support with the perineum while pushing and see if it's okay to use the warm compress. And discuss pushing technique and birthing positions with your care provider beforehand. But most important of all, listen to your body and see what your body needs or wants to do. That's very important. Okay, and at the end, I just want to say that planning is great. Um, you know, doing all the preparation is great, but at the end of the day, it's like running a marathon. Sometimes it's not really possible to know how things will turn out. So I love this quote from, this quote from Sophie Jacobs, who is a midwife at Urban Hatch. She said, there's no superior, inferior way to give birth. There are only mothers and babies with individual circumstances and unique scenarios. It's only love, new life, and new beginnings with individuals starting their lives as mothers and babies starting out in the world. All right. So this is the end of our presentation. I just want to say thank you to Kristen Paris, physiotherapist extraordinaire and our fearless leader for making this happen. And I also want to give a shout out to Lara Stewart Panko at Hypnobirthing Hamilton for giving me the evidence-based information about pushing and birthing positions. Lara has a lot of experience as a prenatal instructor as well as a birthing doula. So if you're interested in her services, please check out her website. And that's it. If you have any questions at the end, please type them in. Or if you're not comfortable um, asking right now, feel free to email me at meapelvicphysio at gmail.com. Okay, so I will look at the comments right now. Mia, it's Kristen. I think that was an amazing overview of a ton of stuff. And I want to thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, thank you, Kristen, for making it happen. Can I ask, uh, I had a couple questions, actually. Yeah. When you talked about perineal massage and you talked about doing um, the perineum pressure for a short period of time until the perineum is released, mm -hmm. uh, how would women know that the perineum is released? Like what would kind of be the, the signs that they could move on to the actual internal release? Yeah. So my gauge for that is just the before and the after. So when you start, you kind of gauge to see how tight it is. And then you wait for a while and see whether you feel that tightness melting away. And usually it does after about 30 seconds to a minute. I mean, I can't say any more than that, um, you know, and sometimes people find it really helpful to come in for an appointment so that we can sort of show them what it's like and how much they should stretch and what that perineum release feels like. But if it's not, I mean, if it's not feasible for them to come in, then yeah, the best way that I can describe it is the before and the after. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. And then the, the other thing, I love the comment about um, 
when you're on a couch and you shift to, you know, you feel uncomfortable. So you shift and you do that innately because you're listening to your body. And I often say to women in preparation for birth that it is an, it's a new situation. It can be anxiety provoking, but to either have themselves or their support person, get them to check in with their body at different intervals to feel, do I feel okay? Do I feel like I need to move? And, and sometimes that's a nice job for the support person because they feel right. a little helpless, a little like they're not yeah. doing very much. Um, and, and then, you know, if the woman is able to move in shift positions and feel better, that's very much supported by the research that the um, ability to change positions yeah. helps us to reduce our pain, potentially speed the active stage of labor. So right. uh, that's one of the comments that I often have when I see women. And I love the fact that you included that. Yeah. No, thank you, Kristen. Yeah. And um, that reminds me of something. So let's say if somebody is, uh, you know, decide to have an epidural, chances are they're either going to be on their back or on their side. So the support person can remind them or can help them turn every half an hour um, to make sure that the, the epidural flows to both sides evenly. And again, as you said, right, it helps to get things moving in terms of the baby's progress to, to, to sort of have that mobility happening frequently. Yeah. And that's a great point too, because I think most women assume as soon as you're having an epidural, you have to be yeah. on your back, but side mm -hmm. lying, mm -hmm. um, has been shown to potentially have less tears and what a great cue to go side to side. Awesome. Yeah. And side lying is great, right? Because it allows the uh, coccyx to move back when the baby is crowning. So you're not having to worry about the coccyx and whether it can move or not. Also, I want to mention this, is that sometimes if people have had an impact on their coccyx, like let's say they fell on it or, um, you know, I don't know, some kind of trauma to their coccyx, their coccyx can be really stiff and it can't move back. So it may also be a good idea to come in and get the coccyx checked out if they, might, if they think there might be an issue with it. Because if the coccyx can't move back, that's going to stall labor. So, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, but I can't see for some reason the questions in the middle, and I'm not sure what happened here. Would you mind reading the questions to me, Kristen, if there's any? Sorry, I was talking away. I was muted. <laughs> <laughs> there aren't any at this point. But if you go out of the screen where you're no longer sharing, you should be able I, to. I'm just going to stop the share here. I'm just like totally a Zoom virgin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, how long should you hold the deep squat or the butterfly? Yeah, so you should start out uh, with about 30 seconds, trying to hold it for 30 seconds, and then slowly increase to about two minutes. But you know, it's totally, everybody's different, and it's totally up to you. If you can only hold it for, I don't know, 20 seconds to begin with, then that's, that's where you should start. Uh, can we use warm during perineum massage starting at 34 weeks? Yeah, definitely. If you want to start using the warm compress then, that's even better. Yeah, in addition to the loop. All right. Do you recommend Kim Vopney's resources? Yeah, yeah, you're very welcome. Um, to be honest, I only read some of Kim Vopney's stuff. I haven't read all of them. So, um, I can't really say one way or the other. What about you, Kristen? Do you have any uh, thought about Kim Vopney's resources? Hi. Oh. Um, yeah, it's Kristen. I like, I definitely like some of her stuff and she is very interesting to listen to or I follow her on Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, I think she has a lot of really good information. I think it come the combination of her resources along with a pelvic health physio assessment is probably a really good combination because she comes at it very much from exercise and movement and all of that is part of what we do. But I think our, as a pelvic health physio, we can address some of the things like even potential stress urinary incontinence and things like that, that, that it's a little tougher to do just strictly from a movement perspective. 
Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. And I think Kim Vapni is, uh, she always recommends pelvic health physiotherapy, right? Yes, she does. Part of her program. Yeah, so, yeah, I think, uh, I think, you know, from what I've read of Kim Vapni, she, she's done some really great stuff. Okay, would you recommend taking a shower during the first stages of labor? For sure, yeah, water, um, like either a tub or a shower has been shown to um, be really uh, good for labor in terms of pain management, as well as, um, I think, was it the duration of labor or reduction of um, intervention? I can't remember, but yeah, but water is a good thing. Uh, what is the best way to book with you and do you have a wait list? Oh, wow. Yeah. So yeah, thank you for saying that. Um, Kristen has a wait list. Um, she's very busy. I am about one week book um, right now. I just joined Blueberry about a month ago. Um, so yeah, I'm not extra busy yet, but you can book us online. I'll call the, uh, call the office to book. Thank you very much. Um, and, and can I just say, in addition to Mia and myself at Blueberry, we have four other pelvic health physios. Yes, that's so, true. So um, Mia is amazing and, and really um, around pre and postnatal, that's kind of the, the thing that you love the most, but we have other physios who are equally as good too. Right, exactly. Yeah, so we have Megan and Shauna and Nicole. Mm -hmm. um, who also do pelvic health and they're amazing. Um, so you're 34, so okay, I'm 34 weeks, have been feeling a lot of pain in my pubic area when trying to move from laying to standing. Will these stretches help reduce the pain? One more, when should we start and stop perineal massage at how many weeks? Okay, so the first question is, in terms of the pain in the pubic area, one theory about that is that um, pubic pain, um, is due to imbalances in the pelvic girdle. So it could be your hip flexor, your um, inner thigh muscles, your outer thigh muscles, your hamstring that are not in balance. So doing the butterfly will address one of those muscles, which is the, the inner thigh, but they won't address the other ones. So yeah, we, uh, so when somebody comes in with pubic pain, pubic pain, I usually test um, all the muscles to see where the, the asymmetry is, and then show you stretching as well as strengthening exercises to help balance out your pelvic girdle. Uh, when should we start and stop perineal massage? Yeah, so you should start around 34, week 34, week 35, and you should do it, uh, you know, two, about two times a week, and you should do that all the way up until labor. Okay, how soon should one seek pelvic floor physiotherapist? I'm 32 weeks. So I usually see mums for um, pelvic floor preparation around week 32. Um, that's when I see them for the first time. And then after that, so at 32 weeks, I usually show them how to do the perineal massage. You know, um, I show them how to do the stomach massage to reduce the diastasis recti. Um, and then around week, 36, 37, I see them again for another session. Um, well, it all depends, right? Depends on what kind of issues they might have. If they have, if the issue is simply about perineum uh, stretching and there's no other complication, it usually just takes like two, two or three sessions. But if let's say if they have tailbone issue um, or pelvic girdle imbalances, it may take a little bit more. How much stock do you put in drinking red raspberry leaf and eating dates for labor preparation. Yeah, so I'm not totally an expert with this. Usually um, this is something that naturopaths recommend and they probably know better than I do. But apparently there's, there's good evidence in red raspberry leaf and, and eating dates for labor, you know. So um, do you know anything about that, Kristen? Sorry, I didn't hear the question, Mia. Uh, drinking red raspberry leaf and eating dates for labor preparation. Uh, how much stock do we put in it? I, I can't honestly say I've read anything definitive. Yeah. 
about that. Um, but we do work closely, as Mia said, with a number of naturopaths. Um, Dr. Carly King uh, in the area is out of the Integrative Health Center. She specializes in women's health concerns and she would be a great person to ask that question to. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So I don't know if there's any of the question, but one of the things I said I would mention at the end, if anybody's interested, is I wanted to talk a little bit about back labor because I have a friend um, who's a doula and she said that back labor, um, you know, is on the rise since COVID. So I wanted to go through that really quickly. So um, before that, though, I noticed there was one more question and I wanted to address that. Um, are there any strategies you would suggest to help move the baby into an ideal position for labor? Okay, so that's exactly what I was going to talk about. Okay, um, because the back labor and baby's positioning are sort of related. So as I said before, uh, when the baby comes out of the pelvic girdle, out of the pelvis, ideally the baby's face should be facing the back and the baby's head should be the facing the front of mom's body. But in some cases, that doesn't happen. And the baby's back of the head sort of pushes on the spine and the face faces the front. Now, the good news is in most cases, the baby flip before they come out. But in some cases, they don't. And that's what they call uh, when the baby is sort of rotated backward. That's what they call back labor or sunny side up baby or occiput posterior baby. And it can be quite painful for mom. Like the contraction is quite intense because the, the pressure from the baby's back of the head is hitting on the spine and all the nerves around it. Now, what can you do to decrease the risk of that happening to put the baby in an ideal position? Now, so first of all, um, and I, you know, I, I learned this from Sophie, uh, Sophie Jacobs, a midwife at Urban Hatch, is before you go into labor, Let's say if you sit a lot, try to sit in a position where your pelvis is higher than your knees. So what I mean is, let's say you put in, if you sit in a bar stool with your feet on the floor, your bum is much higher than your knees. And in that position, your pelvis is much uh, more likely to be in a neutral position or a slightly extended position, which allows the belly or the baby a lot of room to move around. Whereas you sit, let's say, in a saggy couch where your bum is lower than your knees, that sort of squishes the belly, right? Um, so the baby doesn't have as much room to move around. Now, when we talk about the baby's positioning, sometimes the baby is breech or the baby is in a occiput posterior position, posterior position for a reason. Let's say if there's a cord wrapped around the baby's neck, the baby's not gonna turn the right way right? But what we want to do is create an optimal environment for the baby to move around. And we can do that by sitting in a neutral position with our bum higher than our pelvis, uh, than our knees, and also a lot of walking pre-labor. Now, if those options are not possible, what you can also do is at the end of the day, let's say if you spend all day working at your desk, um, you can sort of lean on a table, on a ball, and just sort of let your belly hang. Or you can um, sort of sit uh, in a, you know, with your uh, knees bent, like you're in a, um, I don't know if anybody does yoga, but there's something called a child pose position where your knees are bent and you sit on your feet. And then you can just lean on a ball and just let your, your belly hang forward. So those positions during labor and before labor actually maximize the space in your belly so that the baby can be free to move and you know, that decreases the risk of being, uh, of um, having a back labor or a breech baby. Also, uh, you know, those peanut balls I showed you earlier. Peanut balls are great. Let's say if you, de if you decide to have an epidural, they help to keep the pelvis open during labor, right? So depending on where your, where your baby station is, you can, um, you know, adjust the positioning in your, um, uh, with, the, with the peanut ball to allow your pelvis to open. And that also helps with back labor. Yeah. All right, any other question? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I think that's it. I don't see any more questions. Uh, do you have anything else to add, Kristen? 
I think that was terrific. Um, mm -hmm. And I really appreciate your time and expertise, Mia, um, and answered lots of questions. So I love, I love learning from uh, fellow physios too, because I learn something every time. So thank you so much. Yeah, no, it's my pleasure. And thank you for making this happen, Kristen. Um, yeah, it was great to share this information with all of you. And, um, you know, for uh, those of you who have worked with me before, this is what I look like without my mask. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. All right. Have a good night. And if you have any other questions, please email me at miapalvicphysio.com. Uh, Hi. Okay. Thank you very much, Alexis. Hello, Vanessa. Thank you, Emma. Yep. My pleasure. All right. Thank you, Carly, Katie, yep, Jessica, Sarah, Kristen, Megan, Brianna. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here tonight. All right, take care. Have a good night.